through. Maybe Bo was on one of the papers. And I Eduardo, I think that's part of it. And Levin. Okay. Okay, so now the next talk is by uh, Dimitrios Cosmopoulos. I mean, the gravitational effective field theory I learned on, on the four graviton amplitudes. So, and stuff. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. and. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for putting together such a beautiful conference and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, today I'll be telling you about this work we did with my advisor here at UCLA, V. Byrne, and our collaborator at CERN, Sasa Zibidov. So the motivation behind our work is we want to say something about what is the complete theory of gravity that describes the universe. Well, that is a hard and complicated question. So to make some progress, uh, people have been taking the smallest step, which is, let me for a second forget about the details of the complete theory of gravity, and just assume that it obeys some nice properties like unitarity, causality, et cetera, and ask, given these assumptions, what is the set of low energy theories uh, that could in principle originate from such a complete theory of gravity? There has been great work on this subject, and a good part of this conference is now dedicated uh, to this topic. And now a parallel approach to this uh, question is, let me construct all uh, theories of gravity that I can think of that resemble complete uh, gravitational theories. And maybe if I study them, I can get a hint about what to expect from the actual uh, complete theory of gravity. So on this side, there has been for a while string theory. And now for the first time, there's a second class of theories that we calculated that is a QFT minimally coupled to gravity. Uh, so what we did is we took a massive spinning particle, we spin anything from zero to two, and we integrated out that one loop. Now, this is not uh, a, a full UV completion, but it's to be thought of as an intermediate UV completion, where at the energies around the mass of the particle, we have something that looks like this, and then it's somehow UV completed um, when you go higher than that. So now we can take these two approaches, put them together and see what we learn. And this is a preview of the answer. Uh, so here I am plotting uh, ratios of Wilson coefficients. And these Wilson coefficients correspond to uh, correct deviations from Einstein Hilbert that are built out of eight covariant derivatives and four Riemann tensors. And I am plotting the allowed range for these uh, ratios. So with a green region, I'm plotting uh, what's obtained by assuming that the complete theory is unitary causal and Lorentz invariant. And at the with the red region, I have also incorporated the fact that the low energy theory is crossing symmetric. So now what we found was that when we compute these uh, theories and we put them all together, every single theory lands in this tiny little island, which is well within the, bound the generic bounds. So our analysis now begs the question, can we do better than the red region? Can we actually find bounds that more closely capture what the data is suggesting? And based on the exciting developments that we've been hearing in this conference, it seems that the answer is yes. So that brings me to the outline. Uh, I'll uh, talk briefly about how one goes about to obtain bounds on low energy effective field theories. And I'll discuss the calculation that we did of the one loop amplitudes. And then I'll go ahead and study these islands and see uh, what do we learn from it. So the setup for our low energy theory is we start with Einstein Hilbert and we correct it with an infinite tower of higher derivative operators. Now to match the string theory, I'm also including the possibility of a massless dilaton that will be absent uh, for the case of the massive loops. Now we phrase the full discussion for the bounds in terms of the two to two scattering amplitude. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is that the uh, physical principles we want to impose on the complete theory of gravity are naturally encoded in the scattering amplitude. And as an added bonus, when you talk about on cell quantities, there is no gauge or field basis redundancy. So what does this amplitude look like? 
So here I have made a choice for the polarization vectors or for my external gravitons. And when I do that, I can write my amplitude in this form where I have a, a little group free factor. This is fixed by Lorentz invariance. And this spinner product here for all purposes of today's talk will be simply a uh, square root of the Mandel's thumb invariant S. Then I have a scalar function of the Mandel's thumbs that can be written as follows. And what I'm doing here is, is I'm laying out the mapping between the amplitude coefficients that we find and the Wilson coefficients in the Lagrangian. So today I'm gonna to be discussing regions that correspond to these amplitude coefficients here. But whatever I say is completely uh, one, in one-to-one -one correspondence to Wilson coefficients that one finds in the Lagrangian. So now uh, that we have the description for the low energy physics, what about the high energy amplitude? Here I'm being a little more general, imagining uh, for particles with arbitrary helices, and I'm considering scattering the center of mass frame where particles one and two are coming head on along the z-axis and are outgoing along some angle theta with respect to the z-axis. So it turns out I can write my amplitude in this decomposition where I have a piece that is fixed by Lorentz invariance. And if you wish captures the kinematics, these are polynomials that are known and uh, they're called the Wigner D matrix. And then there is a piece that captures the dynamics and it's unknown. And for example, would we'll take a specific value for string theory or some other value if you look at something else. Now, I don't know this piece, but what I know is that if I choose a so-called elastic scattering, namely I take the difference of the helicities um, from incoming and outgoing particles to be the same, then the imaginary part of this F, also called the spectral density is non-negative. So putting these two together, I have my low energy setup on the left. And then on the right, I have specified to the case at hand with gravitons. And I'm uh, doing the expansion in the S channel and the U channel, both of which have uh, positive spectral densities. And now I wish to match these two. And this matching procedure involves a dispersion relation, a very similar dispersion relation that has appeared in many of the talks in this conference. And when you do this, the answer is um, an equation between low energy amplitude coefficients and high energy physics. Again, we see that uh, we see a separation of dynamics and kinematics. We have some numbers that are fixed by Lorentz invariance. These are to be thought of as Taylor expansions of the Wigner D uh, polynomials. So you can very simply obtain them just by hitting series in Mathematica. And then we have uh, the unknown physics that is captured by these integrals on the spectral densities. They are unknown, but what we do know about them is that they are positive from the optical theorem. So this is the problem at hand. Given this equation, given that these amplitude coefficients are positive sums of given numbers, what is the space that these amplitude coefficients occupy? Now there are both numerical approaches and analytical approaches to this problem, but today we're gonna to be using the ft hedron approach of Arkani, Hammond, Huang, and Huang, which beautifully gives you an analytical solution to this problem. And with what I've laid out so far, it gives you this green region that we see on the plot. There is one more ingredient that goes into this analysis and that is low energy crossing. So what was uh, recently realized by Karn Ho and Van Dong is that this setup does not automatically obey the crossing relations. So here I'm showing an example of crossing relation. So you would think that you don't need to worry about A43 and A44 in this story, since they're simply related by uh, to A41 and A42. However, what uh, they showed in this language is that in, if you instead consider all four coefficients as independent, go through the full eft hedron analysis and obtain some regions, and then only at the very end impose these relations, then you get a region that is smaller than what you would have gotten if you simply uh, uh, studied these two coefficients. Okay. 
All right, so now that we uh, see how we obtain regions, uh, let me go ahead and describe the theoretical data. So again, uh, string theory has been known for a while. The new thing that we did was the uh, massive particles in the loop with anything between spins zero and two. And how we did that is we used the full uh, modern uh, amplitude technology. We um, used double copy to write the gates, uh, to write the gravity integrand at hand in terms of simpler gates theory integrands. Use generalized entirety to build these integrands out of three level amplitudes, super symmetric decomposition to make the problem become easier as we increase the spin rather than harder. We use the integration by parts identities and dimension shifting. All these tricks were lots of fun for me to learn and apply to this problem. And I'd be very happy to discuss any of this later in the questions or afterwards. But for the interest of time, let me jump in the, to the answer. So here I have integrated my amplitude and expanded in the large mass limit to obtain a low energy theory. So I'm showing the values for the amplitude for the various particles in the loop. And these numbers that you see here is what goes into this plot that I showed you, this tiny little black island uh, in that plot. So as a simple example, this number over here is A00 for the scalar. So it's worth staring at this just for a second, just to make the point that there is no apparent structure in these numbers. It was certainly a great surprise to us when we took these numbers, plotted them, and everything landed in the narrow uh, line segment. So for completeness, let me also show you the string theory amplitudes. Uh, this is the full answer. And then when you expand, you can read off uh, the coefficients. So for example, this is the A00 for the superstring. Okay, so that's how we build our theory island. Uh, namely, we take an arbitrary superposition of our eight theories. You can consider different masses, different string lengths, different particle numbers for its theory. Anything you can think of lands you in this uh, tiny little black island within the allowed uh, space. All right, so now I wanna go ahead and study this island and see what is it that makes it special compared to the rest of the space. Uh, so how can I think of this transition between the red region and the black region? But before I do that, let me go back and take one more look at the transition from the green region to the red. And maybe that will give me a hint about how to think of the latter transition. So as we said, we go from the green region to the red by considering crossing. In terms of spectral densities, we obtain the green region by assuming that the spectral densities are positive. But then since the red region is smaller, it must be that within the red region, the spectral densities are somehow restricted. That's simply because if they weren't, we would be in the full green region. And indeed the authors of the two EFT hydron papers realized that there is a restriction that the spectral densities have in the red region. And that's what they call high spin suppression namely for large, some large spin, the spectral densities are smaller than for some uh, earlier, uh, smaller spin. But now you can imagine turning this idea around. Suppose someone were to come to you and say, I have this intuition that my spectral density should obey this high spin suppression that I'm seeing in this red region. Then you would take that intuition, you would calculate amplitudes and you would uh, uh, discover crossing. So in this sense, this is a step forward. Let's understand at least at the practical level what is happening. So the hint here is look at the spectral densities. So let's see the spectral densities for our data are indeed uh, highly restricted. They're not just positive, they're instead uh, monotonically decaying functions with the spin. And the decay is very rapid. So for large spins, there are general arguments why uh, the spectral density should decay, but no one tells you that they should decay for early uh, for small spins. Okay, so there is a lot of structure to be uh, observed here, but we make the simple uh, first step into um, this uh, story and observe that the very leading spectral density is greater 
than any other spectral density in the same channel, and it's greater by at least 100 times in all theories other than the heterotic strain. All right, that's just an observation in the data. Let me turn this around and make this into an assumption and see how the analysis changes once I make this assumption. So we go ahead, we call this low spin dominance. It's an extra qualitative assumption with alpha equals 100. We'll see that it works even for the heterotic string that doesn't have alpha equals 100. And indeed, when you do this, when you make this assumption, the region shrinks down here into this black dust line that very nicely captures where the theories actually land. My theory points here are these points. I've drawn them big uh, to be able to see them. However, they do all land within the dust line. So we do find that in practice, low spin dominance does describe the data, but uh, that's the first step. We'd like to understand what is the physical mechanism that forces the spectral densities to have this behavior. Now we can use low spin dominance to go a step further. Quite surprisingly, we see that the theory island, namely where all the theories live, is very well approximated by a line segment that has a very simple slope of three halves and very simple boundary points of zero. It starts at zero and it terminates a little above three, but for the purpose of today, let's say it terminates before four. So how can we understand this? It turns out that we can understand this in terms of uh, infinite low spin dominance. So let's see what I mean by that. I write again the generic uh, formula for the Wilson coefficients, and I specify it to the three cases of interest to make this plot. I explicitly write down the leading term in its channel, and I capture the infinite uh, tower that comes after that by this term higher spin. So if I implement infinite low spin dominance, what I can do is essentially say that this leading term is infinitely more important and drop everything else. And once I do that, I indeed reproduce these uh, features. I find the three half slope, six over four. And I find that when I make this ratio, this guy divided by this, I'm near zero when this S channel contribution dominates and I'm near four when the U channel contribution dominates. So it seems like low spin dominance works better than it should. It seems like we are on the right track, uh, but we'd like to understand this uh, further. So just to show you that I'm not drawing all my conclusions from a single plot, all um, cases that we looked at share similar uh, features. We have a big region that is obtained by generic considerations. And our theories all land in a very narrow low spot. Uh, low spin dominance with alpha equals 100 very closely captures where they land, but where they actually land is more or less a uh, line segment. And that line segment seems to be described by infinite low spin dominance. Okay. And I couldn't resist adding one last example. This is the one that uh, also appeared yesterday at Simone's talk. Again, we see the same features that our theories um, land in a smaller region than what is expected by general bounds. And it's very exciting that uh, it seems that now this uh, phenomenon seems to be understood uh, based on both Simone's talk and uh, Juden's talk uh, earlier today. Okay, so where can we take it from here? We established, low, uh, we established the islands in two uh, cases, and, uh, namely string theory and uh, QFT minimally coupled to gravity. We'd like to ask, is that a generic feature that we should expect in different cases? Can we see this, for example, if we have a strongly coupled UV theory where one can imagine doing some duality calculation? Can we expect this in, in non-gravitational theory, say Gates theory? Uh, it's also interesting to look at uh, dimensions are greater than four. We have a richer Hilbert space for the graviton, so we expect uh, more rich uh, phenomena. There, we'd have to repeat the spinning parcel wave analysis that has been already done in four dimensions. And there, there is a, also a window for constraints involving G-Newton uh, without the IR uh, cutoff. 
Now, one interesting thing about the theories we considered uh, is that they are physical in the sense that they're not engineered to only give you two to two scattering. They can, in principle, provide you the entire S matrix. And you can imagine that this is a very restrictive construction. So one thing to look at is uh, maybe higher point scattering. And uh, recently there has been a construction of parcel waves. Uh, so it'd be very interesting uh, to study that further. Then uh, next today, I only talked about same uh, dimensionality amplitude coefficients. It'd be very interesting to uh, put that together with an analysis of across dimensionality uh, couplings. Uh, and then also it would be interesting to consider running in the EFT, namely the effects of uh, graviton loops, which I have not uh, today. Okay, so to conclude, I discussed how we calculated the one loop amplitude with uh, massive particles in the loop. Uh, we observed that all physical theories occupy tiny islands in the allowed space, and that these tiny islands seems to, seem to be explained by low spin dominance. I would like to understand the underlying physical mechanism. And that seems to be uh, within reach now based on all these talks we heard. Uh, some things I didn't have time to cover, but we did in the paper. We derived bounds on non-elastic channels. And then we also derived a bound on the uh, graviton self-coupling. Uh, to close, let me put this slide up one last time. Um, in terms of bounds, I like to think of the green region as what we could do in the uh, recent past where we didn't know how to use crossing symmetry. The red region is what we can currently do. And hopefully uh, not in the too far future, we'll be able to obtain bounds that closely capture uh, our tiny island. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... For this nice talk. Uh, is there any questions from people on Zoom or in the, in the audience? In TSLA? Roma says someone is on Zoom. Hey, hi. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. Wonder. Yes. Hey, hi. So, um, so the, the way you were generating the data is uh, integrating out uh, things that are coupled minimally to gravity, if I understood correctly. How would your island change if you were coupling things non-minimally? And uh, especially given that you consider a particle with spin three half, for example, that would expect them to have also no minimal coupling to gravity. How would that enlarge your, your expectation for where we should be landing? Yeah, so the reason why we consider minimal coupling is because that is a, a healthy theory as, a, as in the UV. Um, now, if you were to start including non-minimal couplings, it, it is possible that you would go away from it. But then even the interpretation of an intermediate UV completion would be questionable. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking if it's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I was imagining, for, ex for example, so that, you know, you, you may have uh, layers of UV completions and integrating one previous layer, you generate no minimal coupling to, to the lower layer. And since you are a low energy observer, you, you just see the last one. And then uh, I would expect that would gonna populate larger islands that the one you, you have just seen, but I see, I totally, you know, see that it's difficult to to guess what would be a good starting point that would make sense. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, certainly meaningful and good what you've done. I'm wondering if one can do more. Yeah. Yeah, the reason we didn't, uh, it's probably true. You can probably go away with non-minimal. But the reason we didn't is because there were earlier works that said that that's what um, makes sense as a UV theory. Non-minimal couplings are excluded from uh, time advance uh, considerations. And, yeah. Thank you very much. Nick? Any other questions? 
so if you go beyond tree level in the string theory data points, yeah. data dependence on the axio dilaton peak to peak. So if you look at that at all, I know for DAR to the four, there's results at one and two loops. So between these two small coupling there, they vary. Yeah, we haven't looked at it. Um, there is a reason. Um, in as, as long as you say you, the UV theory is um, uh, weakly coupled, then only the leading term is important. Uh, the, the naive intuition is if, you know, if I need to keep one loop string theory next to tree level, then I also need to keep two loops and then it doesn't make sense what I did. So that's why, uh, yeah, yeah. But then if you could somehow have non-perturbative results, then those would be, um, meaningful to, to, to look at, but we haven't looked at that. Okay. Uh, any further questions or comments? Okay. So if there is no more comments or questions, maybe we can thank, uh, the speaker and yeah, thank you for the nice talk.